Great. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to this space. Um, yeah, just want to welcome you all here and acknowledge the, the territories that we're on. I'm calling in from Dabs Lege, um, had a territory, and just depending on wherever you are, if you're watching this on a recording later um, or here on screen, uh, just take a moment to, to feel some deep appreciation for the lands that you're on and the stewards of those lands. And yeah, I'm excited to chat this evening about co-ops and hear so much from, from folks here. I'll just introduce myself quickly. My name is Midori Campos and I'm the engagement coordinator for Sweelaweed and have just started working. Um, I'm really excited to start diving into, into this work. And my background is uh, in uh, working with youth and had done climate justice work with youth here on island. So I'm excited to continue that work. And just want to start off with to say thanks to Guai Trust for funding this webinar. And um, yeah, tonight we'll be talking about co-ops. So we'll be chatting, um, we'll hear from Madeline and Zoe from the BC Co-op Association and from Don about uh, the Peace Energy Cooperative and then we'll hear from Gule, Cynthia, about the uh, Haida Gwaii Renewable Energy Co-op here on Haida Gwaii. So yeah, we'll start with some intros here. I think it's just us. So we'll maybe ask, I'll call on folks to introduce themselves. And if you want to share uh, your name, uh, what you do, and who you work for, and, and uh, Maybe just as a fun little intro, we'll say, if you had a superpower, what would it be? Why? That's so I'll just call people up. Um, Zoe, do you want to go first? Oh, sure. <clears throat> I'll talk slowly because it'll let me like think about my superpower. <laughs> as I speak. Yeah, thank, thanks, Midori. Really happy to be here. My name's Zoe Creighton. I'm uh, based out of just outside of Nelson, BC. I live on an orchard where all of the apples have fallen and uh, been recently harvested and, and put away or turned into juice. I really appreciate um, living in a rural setting in the Kootenai region on unceded Sinaiq and Tanaha and Silks territory. I'm the executive director of the BC Co-op Association. I share that role with with my colleague Elvezio Del Bianco. So I'm actually the co-executive director and I also am the coordinator for the Upper Columbia Co-op Council, which works with um, co-ops and credit unions in the southeastern part of BC. I did have the opportunity to work um, with folks as as uh, everyone was building the Haida Gwaii Renewable Energy Co-op um, governance documents. So I am I am familiar with the great work that has been put into that co-op and uh, I'm happy to be here. I'll pass the torch or Midori, do you want to? Sure. What's your superpower first? Oh, darn. Uh, memory. I'm just going to say memory because I wish I could remember all of the details, the smells, the sounds, the tastes, the names, the contexts of all of the experiences I have had and the ability to recall them, to, to feel the presence of my, my, uh, my time here so far. That would be my favorite superpower. That's a good one. Awesome. Well, do you want to pass the torch to someone else? Sure, Raven, you're on my left on the screen. Uh sing it la got gets honey kigaga, Raven Riley gets Heidega Honey Kigaga. Um I am the projects and partnerships lead at Sweet Louis. Um and I am happy here to support Midori in this hosting of the session and uh, meeting with you all. Um and so happy to be here. And I think my superpower would be to be able to speak high to kill and understand it more because it is a, a passion of mine and I hope to eventually be able to do that. So hopefully my superpower will come soon. <laughs> oh. I'll get Gus. I think you're building that superpower every day too. 
Great. Uh, how about Gule, Cynthia? She's here, Cynthia. Oh, there we go. I didn't realize I muted it. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Gule Cynthia Samuels. I am currently employed by Old Master Village Council in Finance. I've been there for um, since 97, except for a few few years where I moved to Heiko's Hide a Wild. And um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a nice challenging position. Lots of different things happening there. And um, <clears throat> also on the co-op. And I'm also uh, newly appointed to the Hadawai or the Rediscovery Board. So I'm excited about that to see what we can do with that. Hello. Um, and I have a new grandbaby. She's three months old. And I have another grandbaby coming up in December and a great grandbaby coming up in February. So my house is going to be very busy with lots of babies. So I'm so excited about that. Um, I guess my superpower would be because my handwriting is terrible. My art is terrible. I would love to my superpower would be to be an artist in all the mediums of Haida art. So that would be my superpower. And I would live off that. How are Oh, I love that. I love that superpower for you, Gule. Uh, how about Madeline? Here for me next. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Madeline Reed, or I'm commonly referred to as Maddie. I use she, her pronouns, and I am based uh, on unceded Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh territories, uh, or what we colonially call Vancouver. Um, and I work for the BC Co-op Association as the Education and Communications Manager. Um, and I also am a independent musician in addition to that. Um, and the only thing left is my superpower, right? Have I covered all the other bases? Okay, great. Um, I think I wanna sort of bounce off of what Gus said and say that I would love to be able to speak like every language. I think that would be so cool because um, they use your brain so differently. That's me. Um, hello, Maddie. Yeah, I, that's usually mine that I usually say is I want to understand and speak every language. So there's a theme going on today. Uh, how about let's hear from Don? Uh, sure. <clears throat> My name is Don Pettit. I'm um, executive director of Peace Energy Renewable Energy Cooperative based in Dawson Creek, Northeast BC. Um, yeah, I am more or less in charge of marketing and communications. So I do a lot of this kind of work. Um, also photography and videography and everything we need in the way of communications from brochures to newsletters and PowerPoints and blah, 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 that kind of thing. Um, and I do, I've been with the co-op since it was formed on and off, you know, um, but I was one of the founding members of the co-op back in 2003, um, and been with it on and off ever since. Right now I'm in this ED role. And um, we're entering some really exciting times with our co-op right now, which I'll get into on the PowerPoint. But um, I guess as my superpower, I would want, just thinking about it off the top of my head here, I would say, um, yeah, unlimited energy would be wonderful. <laughs> I find I'm stretched pretty thin. And uh, as I get older, I find my energy decreasing. And I don't like that at all. So let's get rid of that. I just have unlimited energy forever. That'd be nice. Well, there'd be so many solar panels up in Dawson's Creek, okay? <laughs> That's true. Yeah, I feel like all the superpowers here make a pretty great community. Great. Well, how about everyone for introducing yourselves and for being here today, and how to those that um, that are here and tuning in. Uh, maybe just as like for everyone here, I'll put a little a little ask to the to the group maybe you can put it in the chat 
how much do you know about co-ops? You can put it in the chat, like five being like, I'm an expert. I have lots of experience in co-ops and zero being like, I maybe get groceries at co-op, but I don't really know much more than that. Um, so yeah, people want to pop it in the chat. What, how much do we know about co-op? Put mine in there. And as people are putting that in, I'll just say that, yeah, why we're talking about co-ops today is that during the 2018 Haida Gwaii Renewable Energy Symposium that was co-hosted by the Council of the Haida Nation and Sui Lawid, Sui Lawid heard that Haida Gwaii wanted to be the owners, decision makers, and investors in small-scale renewable energy solutions to get Haida Gwaii off diesel and become energy sovereign. And so at the symposium and in later conversations, the co-op model was suggested as one of the ways that we could do that on island. So over the past few years, there's been the renewable energy co-op uh, I talk about today that's starting to emerge um, with the leadership of a few local women. And uh, Sue Lewis is really yeah, proud to be one of those founding partners um, to offer some support as they, as they launch. So with that, uh, we can jump into it. So maybe we'll start off if Zoe and Maddie um, would like to take it off with your presentation. Yeah, sounds good. Let me just... Uh... We launch that. Uh, I'm I'm the supporting act uh, here here as follow up or, or question fielding. Maddie is going to take the reins on this one. Okay, let's see how this goes. Thanks for being here, Zoe. It's always nice with with a team. Uh, share screen. All right, how does it look? Awesome. Sweet. So yeah, I guess we'll jump basically right into it. Um, since we've introduced ourselves as well, that's great. Uh, this will just be a really brief, like 20 minute introduction to co-ops. Um, you know, when I was thinking about what I would put in the ch chat as my number for knowledge of co-ops, I think I would put a four, even though I give this presentation and theoretically in the authority, because there is always so much to learn. And um, so this is going to be a very brief overview, but hopefully a really nice um, foundational um, presentation to just understand the, the nuts and bolts. And then I encourage you to go forth if you're still interested and learn more because there's always so much to learn about cooperatives. Um, but just really briefly to give some more context about where Zoe and I are coming from um, in terms of workplace, we work at the BC Cooperative Association and we call ourselves sort of the um, BC's Cooperative Knowledge and Resource Center. And so what that looks like is we provide a lot of different services and supports and do a bunch of different activities to support the cooperative movement across the province. And so this can look like education services, which is what brings us here to talk to you today. Um, we also do a lot of co-op development support for groups looking to start um, or scale up their cooperatives. Uh, we also provide support services to existing co-ops so that they can continue to do their good work for their communities. We also do a lot of um, advocacy and lobbying to the government to increase legislative support for the co-op movement. If you look at um, places around the world where there are really strong cooperative economies, they often are supported by legislation that enables them to, to, to thrive better. And then finally, we do a sort of coordination. So um, working on supporting the collective co-op ecosystem and movement across the province. Without further ado, we'll jump in to the presentation and just start with the basic question, what is a cooperative? So if we look at the, the definition often provided online, it's a uh, cooperative is a voluntary association of members that come together to serve some kind of common need. And so we have this nice ring of little white dots we can think of as either individuals or potentially whole organizations who come together to try and accomplish something that would either be really challenging or perhaps impossible for them to achieve independently. As they come together, all members, which are the sort of little white dots, all members purchase a share in the organization, which means that all members are co-owners of the cooperative. And in doing so, these shares generate a shared pool of capital that the co-op can then use to address its common need, whether that be uh, you know, purchasing 
um, resources or uh, investing in infrastructure, um, hiring staff, whatever it is that is needed. Uh, and by pooling all their capital together, they also own everything in common, um, which is pretty, pretty cool. Members also get an equal vote in electing a board of directors. And I've bolded equal vote because I think that's a very, it's a very distinguishing feature to cooperatives versus other kinds of organizations. And we'll dig into that a little bit in a second. Um, but yeah, essentially the members come together, there's an election, everyone gets an equal vote, no matter how much money you've invested in the co-op and they elect from the membership, a board of directors, which we can think of as represented by this little inner circle here. And the board, is really responsible for making the key decisions that ensure the co-op is able to achieve its goals. So they're the ones that will do the hiring if there's hiring or figure out where to allocate the, the financial resources to be able to acquire the, the things they need to do their work. If the co-op makes a surplus at the end of the year, um, the members then get to decide where the money goes. Note this will, there are for-profit and not-for-profit co-ops. So this is something that happens specifically in a for-profit scenario. Um, but if, if the co-op makes money, they can decide where it goes. And this can kind of be allocated generally uh, two different ways. The first is patronage returns, which is the cooperative equivalent of dividends. And so what that looks like is um, at the end of the year, the surplus is uh, distributed based on how much members used the cooperative. So um, I know Midori mentioned the cooperative grocery store. Let's say you're shopping at the co-op. Uh, if you're someone who shops there every week, you buy all your, your goods there, um, you would get a greater patronage return than someone who only goes there maybe once a month or once every couple of months. The other option is reinvestment into the co-op. And this you know, can look at improving uh, the services that the co-op provides. Uh, perhaps it's lowering prices, perhaps it's growing and expanding the cooperative so it can you know, increase the amount of work it's able to do. Um, it's really about deciding what's gonna best serve the membership. You know, we've, The members are the ones who are really guiding what the co-op's activities are going to be. And so if redistributing that wealth through patronage returns is gonna be what supports members best, then that's great. Or, you know, if securing the, the co-op so that it can continue to do work um, and continue to serve its members into the future is going to be the most helpful, um, then that might be what they decide. That's a pretty quick overview of, of what a co-op does and how it works. Um, but I think what really helps solidify sort of what makes a co-op different from, say, a society, a not-for-profit um, society, or a for-profit company um, is, let's, so let's compare, let's compare those and see what, what makes the difference. We'll start with building the company structure and sort of analyzing how that works. At the top of the company, we have um, shareholders, and some subset of those are directors. And they are chosen by whoever has invested the most money into the company. And they're sort of providing the governance structure. So already there we see a pretty big difference where in the co-op it's elected and it's an equal vote. In this case, we have the shareholders and they're determined based on however much money they've invested. Uh, sort of separate from that, we have the actual operations of the company. So that's the president or CEO uh, who hires management and staff to carry out the actual operations and what the company is to do. And then below that, we have the customers, and we'll see this sort of two arrows pointing down towards the customers and up away. And we can think of that as the goods and services being delivered to the customers, and in turn, the customers are generating revenue for the company. And then at the end of the year, the surplus, or in this case, the profit, um, well, they're the same thing, but the profit surplus gets distributed back to the shareholders um, through dividends. So that's kind of like the patronage ret returns we were talking about. But the difference here is that those dividends are distributed based on um, how much folks have invested rather than how much say they've used to the company because they're also not the people using it. They're just the people owning it. Great. And then let's talk about the society or the not-for-profit. And Within the not-for-profit society, we have also members like a cooperative, but I've outlined the members here with a dotted line to sort of um, highlight the 
the less concrete nature of members, maybe we could say, in a society where in the case of a co-op, we saw that the members are the people who contribute money and they're the ones directly benefiting from the society, or sorry, from the co-op. In the case of a society, the members also contribute a membership fee to then be able to um, elect a board of directors, but they don't have to be the people who are actually using the cooperative. It could just be someone in the community who wants to you know, get involved, um, contribute to supporting a good cause and supporting an organization, but they might not be the people actually looking to receive the goods or services that the society provides. Um, you know, for example, you might have a, a non for profit that um, provides meals for you know folks and um who are experiencing food insecurity um but the people on the board may or may not be the folks who are actually looking to receive those meals they might be other folks in the community then we have the board again electing some kind of executive director who hires staff and then they carry out the operations of the society in the case of a society, we have um, financial resources coming from some sort of external source. So the, whether that be donations or grants, um, foundations, uh, government funding, these types of things. And then because it's a not-for-profit, all of that gets translated into goods or services for the broader community or the community they're trying to serve. All right, let's go back to the cooperative structure and go back to this nice circle that we started with of the members and see how in being sort of the container for the cooperative, the members are also really the foundation and the core of, of the cooperative and how it does its work. So sort of like we've seen on the other slides, the members, you know, elect a board of directors who hires an executive director or CEO, depending on the context, they hire management, staff, and then we actually end up back at the members. Staff are delivering some sort of good or service back to the membership. So we started with the members and we've also ended with the members. And then this works in terms in sort of the opposite direction as well, where staff will report to management back to the executive to the board and then the board is responsible for reporting out to the membership. So we see here the members are really considered at, at some very key points throughout the process of delivering the good or service, um, which is pretty unique to a cooperative. And then just to quickly summarize. Um, some key points that we have talked about and maybe some new ones as well. If we're comparing these three types of organizations and we think about the ownership, who owns this organization? In the society, there is no ownership. Um, it's sort of its own entity. In the cooperative model, it's the members who own it. And in the company context is the shareholders. If we think about then who controls the organization in the society and the cooperative, we have this sort of equal voting, which you'll often hear referred to as one member, one vote. But as we sort of talked about this, um, the membership is pretty different in a society and cooperative, where in a cooperative, you're really, the people who are voting are the folks who are really um, looking to benefit from the cooperative, whereas in the society, it's not so much that way, or not necessarily that way. And in the company, the control is based on investment. If you've invested more dollars, you have more of a say in what happens. Then if we think about the impact of this in terms of wealth distribution, in a society, there is no wealth distribution. It's a not-for-profit. Um, in a cooperative, that money goes back to the membership in some way, whether that's to the cooperative or to its members directly. And then in a company, it's back to the shareholders. And I think this really highlights a key distinction about a cooperative and why they're so good also at generating wealth um, within communities and supporting community wealth. Um, often cooperatives are located in particular geographic regions. And so when they're able to distribute wealth to the membership, um, they're able to support community economic development. Whereas in the case of a company, if you have shareholders, they could be anywhere in the world. And then that becomes a very extractive model where if money is, you know, um, generated within a community, but then ends up extracted, going to shareholders around the world, um, you lose out on that that's, um, economic growth and development. And then finally, if we think about the core purpose of each of these organizations, in a society, it's to serve the community or a particular community. Uh, in a cooperative, it's to serve its members. And in the case of a company, it's really, even if it's with a social purpose, it's also to create a return on investment. And I think that's a key distinction as well. Now we're trucking along, this is a lot of info, but I think we'll have time for questions at the end. So stick with me and then we can talk about it after. Um, 
the other thing that's very unique about cooperatives is that they are the only organization type that has internationally agreed upon values and principles. So with the 3 million cooperatives around the world that exist, all cooperatives are sort of following and, and um, trying to practice these same values and principles. And I'll just go through them relatively briefly, but they're nice to know. Um, the six cooperative values um, are self-help, self-responsibility, democracy, equity, equality, and solidarity. And these really inform um, how the cooperative ethos and um, the cooperative principles, which are the ones you, if you know about co-ops, you've probably heard them talked about a bit. There's seven cooperative principles. The first is voluntary and open membership. And this is the idea that people who can assume the responsibility of membership and also um, would benefit from membership should be able to join the cooperative without discrimination based on their lived experiences or identity. Um, and also that um, people should be able to opt in and shouldn't be forced to join a cooperative. And sometimes people think this is a weird, the voluntary aspect is a weird thing to include, but it's um, actually, I think, really important as cooperatives have been used as a um, sort of colonial tool for economic development. Um, and so to really ensure that it's really important to ensure that people are not only um, open and allowed to join, but also that they're not being forced. Number two is member democratic control. So again, this is the idea that the members are setting the policy, making the decisions, and that every member gets an equal vote. Number three is uh, member economic participation. So this is that uh, the membership decides where the money goes and is generating that, that financial capital. Number four is autonomy and independence. And this is members deciding, you know, how the co-op operates and following the principles without um, external influence. And those four are actually, I've been told, legal requirements in BC. The other are sort of nice to haves, but you can imagine how that would vary from uh, legal jurisdiction to legal jurisdiction. So it's cool that these are internationally agreed upon regardless of the legal context. Um, number five is education, training, and information, which is uh, the idea that co-ops are investing in educating their members so that members can meaningfully participate in their co-op. And as you can imagine, if you have an organization that's run by members, you want them to be um, empowered with the knowledge and understanding and skills to be able to, to participate fully and effectively. Number six is cooperation among cooperatives, which is the idea that we, um, it makes sense, you know, we cooperate internally within our own co-ops, but we also can support each other by cooperating with, as a movement and that we are better off working together than in competition. And number seven is concern for community. So standing in solidarity with one another and putting the people and planet first. Great, now we know a little bit about how co-ops work. We know how they differ from societies and companies. And we also have learned about the values and principles. And so now I wanna talk about like how this actually manifests. How, what do co-ops functioning in the world actually look like? And Something that's amazing and sometimes confusing about the cooperative model is that it's an incredibly adaptable model and has many different takes many different forms, depending on the context. So it's very useful and um, yeah, like I said, can be confusing. So we'll go through a bunch of different examples um, to sort of explore how it can manifest in these different contexts. So the first example is the producer co op and or sometimes referred to as the marketing co op. But in the case of a producer co-op, what you have is you have individual businesses or organizations who come together um, to achieve something collectively that's easier to do together. So the example we have here is Authentic Indigenous Seafood, which previously was called River Select Fisheries. So you may have heard of them under that name. And their members are all Indigenous fisheries across BC. So it's not individual people, it's the fisheries themselves who have all formed this cooperative. And they formed a co-op because they their need was to sell their products while harvesting in alignment with cultural and sustainable values. So they really wanted to um, work together to leverage um, some collective marketing and also the ability to better distribute their products. Um, but they also have you know the standard of wanting to harvest um, responsibly and in alignment with their cultural values. So they formed this co-op together um, to create this sort of collective brand to be able to do this work. Uh, we also have what's called a worker cooperative, which is perhaps somewhat intuitive. It's when the workers of a company or organization all collectively own the co-op together. 
And this example is based in uh, Victoria, BC, and it's the International Women's Catering Co-op. And their members are women cooks and caterers from immigrant backgrounds based in Victoria. And they were looking to find stable, well-paying and culturally appropriate, flexible work with benefits. So these women came together, um, they joined to form a worker owned catering business and this, you know, enables them to more easily access kitchen space, um, to be able to sell at markets together. And also again, to sort of have this, um, this collective identity, this recognizable brand that they can share. Next, we have the consumer co-op. Some of you may have been to this place. I have not, um, but uh, there are two consumer grocery store co-ops on Haida Gwaii in Masset, and I believe the other one is Skidigit. Is that correct? Okay, great. <laughs> um, and so in the case of a consumer co-op, hopefully also somewhat intuitive, it's the consumer, the, the shoppers um, on Haida Gwaii who go to these stores and are buying the goods and serve, the goods that they um, would like to have. And often consumer co-ops come together, um, grocery store co-ops come together because folks are seeking quality products and services at affordable prices um, or more affordable prices, or perhaps to access something that's a little bit harder to, to get in their location. Um, and so they pool resources to be able to source quality products that they want and need. Um, and also often in the case of consumer co-ops, um, the consumers receive patronage returns. So this also is distributing wealth back into the community, which is really great. We also have the credit union, which is effectively a consumer co-op as well, but a financial consumer cooperative. Uh, the example here is Northern Savings Credit Union located on Haida Gwaii, um, as well as in Prince Rupert and Terrace. And their folk members are banking and financing clients who are looking to access um, affordable banking services, financing options, and loans and control over decision making. So they come together to be able to pool assets and, um, and be able to access these things in more affordable ways. This is a, the next two examples are from Ontario, but I think they're really cool, so I wanted to share them here. Um, we have, of course, also housing cooperatives, and this one is the um, Ansar Community Housing Cooperative, which is based in Scarborough, Ontario, and it's a cooperative specifically for Muslim individuals and families, and they came together seeking stable, affordable housing that's accessible and also um, involve, includes culturally appropriate financing uh, that's aligned with Muslim practices, one of which is no interest. So that's not a common practice in our sort of dominant Canadian society. And so being able to come together and access that, that was culturally aligned, in a way that's culturally aligned was really important. Um, and so they were able to create a home financing cooperative where members purchase shares and then receive housing on kind of a, um, a rotating basis. And then, the last example I have here is the community service co-op, which essentially means the not-for-profit co-op. So usually a not-for-profit co-op will also be another, you know, it'll be a, have some kind of, you know, it'll be a worker or a consumer co-op, but it's also not-for-profit. Um, and the example here is of the Aaron Theatre, which is located in Campbellford, Ontario. And the members are individuals and families in the community who want to see movies and events. Um, and they wanted to Basically, the theater was going out of business and but they really wanted to keep it in the community as a very important cultural hub. So, you know, they wanted to maintain this primarily indigenous led cultural hub within the community that showcased art and film and culture. So the community came together to be able to buy the theater um, and it's not for profit because they're not trying to turn a profit. They just want to maintain this cultural community asset, um, which is pretty, pretty awesome. And then briefly, I just want to put up this slide here, which is essentially just some really big names and co-ops that people often don't know are cooperatives, um, such as sports teams like Barcelona FC or the Green Bay Packers or the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Um, in fact, most Spanish soccer teams are cooperatively owned by the fans. Um, we also have things like Home Hardware or Pharmasave, um, Tillamook and Ocean Spray, these, these names that perhaps people know really well, but are actually also co-ops because often people think of co-ops as very, very small, but they can also be very, very big and very successful and wonderful too. And finally, just to summarize, or just, you know, as we're getting near the end, want to highlight the the sort of global nature of the cooperative movement that I alluded to earlier, and this have this sort of uh, nested circles diagram that really showcases the the sort of tiers of or tiers levels. We're trying to circles, so we're trying to not to have a hierarchy. <laughs> But um, the, the um, 
the different elements of support we have at different um, scales. So, you know, we have your co-op or individual co-ops on this like sort of grassroots level. And then there are associations um, like the BC Cooperative Association or as Zoe mentioned, the Upper Columbia Co-op Council that she works for. These associations that are there to sort of support co-ops um, on a larger scale. There's also a Canadian equivalent, the Co-ops Cooperatives and Mutuals Canada, which supports us and the co-ops across Canada. And then there's also the International Cooperative Alliance. And they're the ones who have sort of review the principles and values and make sure they're current and do sort of different sort of advocacy on a global scale. So there's lots of lots of people doing cooperative work. There's lots of support at all sorts of levels. Um, yeah, there's lots of amazing work happening. And then finally, at the end of the presentation, I just want to, if you were going to leave with five sort of key points today, I want to have them here for you, which is that co-ops are found across sectors. They are adaptable in structure. Um, they are democratic and autonomous. They are in service of their communities and also dependent on engaged members so that they can function effectively. That's it. Thank you. And I'll also say awesome. that I have, I think I said we could share the slide deck out, um, but there's the, I have a bunch of resources on a, the very last thing. So if you get this presentation and you, there's more things you want to learn about, um, you can visit this, the, look through to the end of the presentation. There'll be more to learn as well. Great. Thank you so much, Maddie. Um, that was so informative and such a great way to ground our understanding co-ops here and I know for my brain is just percolating I'm like oh like I feel like grounded in those values and principles like co-ops have been along around for a long time and maybe even like before they were called co-ops but just based in communities taking care of each other having engaged members and you know doing things for community benefit so um yeah however for that and uh, maybe we'll move forward to the next presentation. So if folks have questions for Maddie, maybe hold on to them or put them in the chat. I just want to make sure we get to all of our presentations and then we'll have space to, to ask questions uh, at the end. So if um, you don't think you'll be able to remember them, please just put them in the chat and we'll make sure to, to circle back to them and ask any of those questions. Um, but yeah, that was such a lovely way to to deepen our understanding of co-ops. And now we'll move on to Don from Peace Energy Cooperative. And it's been a co-op that's been around for over 20 years. Uh, so really looking forward to hearing what you have to share, Don. Okay, just getting things working here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So is that working? Are we showing the slide? Excellent. Okay. Um, yeah. So Don Pettit, Peace Energy Renewable Energy Cooperative, Dawson Creek, BC. That's in Northeast BC. Um, I'll just start running through some of this. Um, so we were Western Canada's first renewable energy co-op, uh, incorporated way back in 2003. And we're licensed to operate anywhere in Canada. We are a for-profit investment cooperative. Uh, I'll just describe a little bit more about that as we go on maybe um we have uh, 661 members as of today if i if i'm right um and what we do is we develop projects renewable energy projects and then uh, finance them uh through a share offering to our members who, who then invest in the project and and then earn returns on those investments um and we're yeah we do a lot of solar power in northeast bc and northwest alberta uh, values, well, we just went through those, so, um, but yeah, we, we have certainly a strong environmental ethic, you know, being a renewable energy co-op, um, but also, yeah, for profit, we have to do profit, um, in our sense, uh, we, in, in the first place, we have, you know, renewable energy, we think, has to make economic sense, otherwise, it's just not going to work, it's not going to happen, and of course, now we know that it does make tremendous economic sense, but and we have to pay dividends to our member investors, and we also have staff and overhead expenses that we have to meet, much like any business, I guess, would. Um, so our first project, uh, yeah, just to say that way back in 2002 or thereabouts, we uh, it was just a small group of, um, actually it was two, myself and one other fellow, we used to do lunch and talk a lot about co-ops. 
um, and different business models and co-ops kept coming and coming back. But then at that time in Northeast BC here, um, we all knew that we had a pretty good wind industry here, like good resource because it's a windy area. And uh, as we were starting to talk about this, um, there was these wind prospectors coming into the region and snapping up all the good wind sites. So that's what really got us off our butts and forced us to form our cooperative. We said, we better get cracking here if we're going to do this uh, and snap up one of these uh, wind sites. There happened to be a really good one right near Dawson Creek, a little ridge, Bear Mountain Ridge right near Dawson Creek. So we did, we quickly got a bunch of volunteers together. We all threw some money into it, got the co-op going and snapped up this uh, lovely ridge site for a wind farm, uh, Bear, Mountain, uh, uh, Bear Mountain Ridge, yeah. So that was our first project. We launched right into that as soon as we were formed uh, because the BC government was also putting out what they call the call for clean power. So they are uh, open to a group such as ours or any corporation or of any kind to come in and develop wind power and then sell the sell the uh, power onto the BC hydro grid for a certain price on a uh, independent power producer contract, which in our case was 25 years. Anyway, so we jump right into this monster project. Um, we had no idea what we we're getting into, but we knew it was going to cost a lot of money. So we looked for partners. Uh, because we were fledging a little co-op in Northeast BC, small town, no money. Uh, so we had to have partners to do this. So we did find an excellent partner who was very co-op oriented and wanted to maintain the natural values of this ridge as much as possible. And that was Aeolus Wind Power Corporation. This was their first um, wind, wind park project too. Um, and then they put in the millions of dollars required to do the environmental assessment and, and, and put up the wind monitoring stations and prove the site. You know, we have to collect the data and prove the site as, as a good wind site. And then uh, when that was all done and said, um, uh, we had to look for another partner that had the big, really big bucks to actually build this thing, which was about $200 million and all the gas uh, came in a gas company that was diversifying and continues to diversify into renewables. And they uh, they put up the big bucks. Um, we were sort of the on ground, on the ground, local. Our office was where people could come to ask questions about this. We were building the membership of our cooperative, of course. We held over 30 public meetings. Um, and uh, we were saying, well, we hosted and organized those, et cetera. Um, here we are very early in our, in, while this was all happening, uh, very just a newly formed, um, going to trade shows, talking about wind farms and wind energy everywhere we could. And uh, one of the, Laura left there as one of our public meetings, very well attended. Uh, we had a lot of interest from the community and the region. Um, and then here we are building it. Uh, eventually, after uh, after all the gas stepped in, we had the money and away we went, uh, started spending it like crazy. And um, we, it was a really an exciting time to see the parts coming in. The towers were made in Saskatchewan. The blades and turbines were made in Germany. They're Entercon three megawatt uh, turbines, 34 of them. And, but it was all local, you know, a lot of local hiring. Hundreds of people were hired to build this thing over a couple of years. Uh, a lot of local uh, prosperity came out of this. Uh, these were very large turbines, um, some of the largest in the world at that time. Um, and uh, there's the string along the ridge, uh, 34 of them just being completed. And um, you get sort of a scale there and you see the size of the trees. These are big turbines, as they say, three megawatt each. And here they are just getting fired up and starting to work. <clears throat> uh, you can see, and this, this is a picture of Dawson Creek lit up at night by wind power. You can see the uh, turbines uh, along the ridge there, it's silhouetted against the sunset. And so uh, at this moment, uh, Dawson Creek became uh, BC's uh, first wind powered city. So we were pretty proud of that. The wind farm powers the equivalent of about five or, and in a good wind powers the equivalent of about five or six Dawson Creeks, population 12,000 or about 135,000 homes. 
While that was all happening, we were also working with Northern Lights College. That's our local college here. They've got four or five campuses across Northeast BC um, to uh, get into teaching about renewables, actually. And so that up on the upper left there was our concept that we presented to the college, which was like a house with fully laid out with geothermal heating, solar power, wind power, some classrooms, some offices. Um, they liked the idea a lot, uh, so much that they kind of took over the whole thing. We we continued to be advisory on the on the count on the advisory committee, and we were very much involved. But um, they kind of took it and applied for an eight million dollar grant and created the um, the facility you see in the lower right there. Um, that's uh, now they teach a wind turbine maintenance uh, course there in this uh, new. Um, demonstration center for and teaching center for renewables on the Dawson Creek campus. Uh, meanwhile, after the wind power project was done, and we'd been looking at looking for another project. Well, while we were looking for other projects, the price of solar plummeted, as you know, about 10 years ago. The solar started to come way, way, way down. Like, you know, when we were doing the wind farm, solar wasn't even an idea. Uh, it was too impractical. It was too expensive. But suddenly, as you probably all know, it came down very quickly, very suddenly. And we said, "Woo, OK, well, we're looking for another big project for our members. Let's start selling solar. So we've entered that into a business that runs within our business. Uh, we design, supply and install custom solar uh, facilities, power stations for homes and municipalities uh, and farms and ranches around the area. And that's become a major source of income for our cooperative that covers our overhead and our staff uh, payments, um, wages and benefits, et cetera. Uh, it's been quite successful. Uh, we've put over, we just passed our 1 million watt, uh, I guess, yeah, record. Um, so we put up about one, just over 1 million watts now of custom solar in the, that's in the BC and Alberta Peace region. That's Alberta would be Northwest Alberta and we're in Northeast BC. So this region is our service area. And we have an excellent solar resource here too, besides wind. We have a very, very excellent solar resource here. Um, then, this, then this came along as the largest project we've done to date was the district of Hudson's Hope, which is just an hour drive west of Dawson Creek in the Rocky, at the edge of the Rocky Mountains there. We're still in Northeast BC. Um, and they uh, approached us and we helped them get a, a gas tax grant, federal gas tax grant for 1.4 million. And their goal was to put up as much solar as they could on all their municipal buildings to get rid of their, their reduce their you know, rising electrical costs that just keep going up and up and up. So we helped them get the grant. They got the grant, we went to RFP, we got the RFP um, and we started putting up these very large solar arrays. Um, uh, on their municipal buildings. Um, and uh, we did a lot of local hiring. We hired seven uh, local uh, high school students uh, from the Hudson Hope uh, School. And, um, and they were great uh, helpers. And we did uh, presentations. Anyway, oh, here's some of the, here's some of the uh, arrays we put up. Uh, the public workshop there on the left is 100% uh, solar powered, net zero. Um, the Hudson Soap Arena is about half solar powered. Um, Hudson Soap Sewage Lagoons. Uh, this is a big, big uh, ground mount array that powers their sewage lagoons and actually produces more power than that needs, as it turns out. And so now they're getting all of their street light, all their street lighting power for nothing. Um, this was our favorite one. Uh, they've got a beautiful outdoor uh, heated pool, swimming pool, public swimming pool. Uh, for the community in a nice park area. And we wanted to put up something a little different uh, that would indicate water, right? So we, this we call the solar wave. Uh, they also wanted some shade and uh, they wanted sort of a, something that would be a bit of a tourist attraction, plus help, of course, pay for the electrical needs of this facility. So this was one of the nine uh, rays that we put up for the District of Hudson's Hope. They're very happy. They're saving about $75,000 a year 
on electrical bills right now. Um, we, we've maintained you know, the arrays. We have the operation and maintenance contract with them, but it doesn't cost much to keep them running. There's not much maintenance. Uh, we just keep a close eye on things and make sure they're all working at top performance. Um, and they're, they're pleased. So they'll be saving um, well, millions of dollars over the life of the systems in electrical bills. And of course, we did uh, a lot of public presentations uh, to get the community on side, local hiring. Oop, where'd that go? And we, we, we trained up their staff uh, at the municipal level uh, to help us uh, maintain the arrays and monitor them. And, um, and it was, we really pulled the community together around this. And it was a, a great experience for everybody. Here we are cutting the ribbon at a big party. A bunch of politicians came out and um, and the community was very engaged in all of this and continues to be so. I'm pretty proud. Like uh, Hudson's Hope is a thousand people, right? So they're they're pretty well the most solarized community per capita in Canada. I think I can't prove that, but it's got to be pretty close. <laughs> this is our latest project, a uh, solar project. Again, you know, wind. The thing about wind is that it takes a huge amount of cash. Uh, that was uh, that. To, to put up a significant number of wind turbines takes a lot of money. You can't like put up one or two wind turbines usually. Um, I suppose there's special situations, but if you're a business trying to make a profit on wind, uh, you have to go big. Uh, that's not the case with solar. Uh, solar is much more scalable, um, and we've become uh, you know experts in solar, so we're very much into. Um, producing more and more energy with solar rather than going back to wind or something, because we can make it of a scale that our co-op can afford to actually finance, own, and maintain. Um, so uh, this is our latest project. We've been working on this for almost three years now. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be a solar farm. Um, it promises to be Western Canada's first community-owned, operated um, grid utility scale feeding into the grid uh, solar farm. We'll see, um, but that's uh, we're, we're, we're scheduled to uh, go to a share offering to our members and uh, build it uh, this coming year. We'll see how that goes. Um, but yeah, uh, utility grid scale solar, single axis tracking. Um, uh, we have the land uh, secured, 25 year lease with uh, first right of uh, re renewing that lease. Uh, we're shooting at five megawatts. Um, it's going to cost about $11 million. Should be running for at least 25 to 35 years. And then we would just, you know, put in new solar panels, more efficient ones, and just keep producing power from that site indefinitely, as far as we can tell. Um, and we're, our idea is like, you know, one solar farm, five megawatt is not going to save the world. You know, it's, it's still pretty small. Um, compared to, the, say, the electrical usages of the uh, province of Alberta, which is heavily uh, coal and gas fired. Um, so we see this as a template. We're trying to develop a template that can be reproduced by other smaller organizations, other maybe other cooperatives, um, That so, so that we can, A, we're going to build more of these ourselves, uh, but also we want to help other people build uh, similar facilities across across the province or wherever, because we've learned so much uh, over the last uh, three years getting ready to do this. Um, so a share offering to our members is planned to go out early in the coming year and construction during the same year. Um, so we have five megawatts on 13 hectares, generating about uh, 10 gigawatt hours per year, uh, avoiding 5,000 tons of CO2 per year. Uh, power is equivalent of about 12,000, 1,200 homes. And it will be, as I say, a grid tied, uh, single axis tracking, feeding power into the grid uh, for profit. That's one of the unique things about Alberta, which is why we're doing it in Alberta. We can't do this in British Columbia right now and feed into the grid for profit. That may change, but at the moment, uh, when we started this, the only place we could do that that was handy uh, was Alberta. They have a free market grid. You can build a solar farm, feed the power into the grid, and uh, make a profit. 
Uh, so yeah, so this is a rough layout. The engineering is pretty well all complete now. We're almost ready to start ordering the equipment. Um, this is roughly the size, similar. It's the similar uh, size to what we'll be building, about 13 hectares, 12,000 solar modules. And we're certainly going to be integrating agriculture into the facility. Um, right now, it's like abandoned pasture land. Is, we chose it because it's not very good land. Um, and But we're going to be uh, bringing that land back to life. We're going to be... Um, we have local people like we've got a local uh, sheep uh, farm who wants to put put their sheep in there to keep, help keep our grass down which we have to do um and uh so we can rent it out for grazing um and also a beekeeper nearby wants to put uh some hives in the the enclosure because it's a secure enclosure um and then we'd be planting uh and pollinating flowers and things for him and so we're going to integrate as much. It's a very agricultural area. There's a lot of agricultural expertise in the area. Why wouldn't we use it? Why wouldn't we improve the soil? It needs improving. It's been abused. It's been overgrazed. So we can bring the soil back. We can bring the biodiversity back uh, to this site, as well as generating a significant amount of renewable energy and generate income and profit to our member investors. Uh, so yeah, here's the business model. Uh, we can feed uh, free market grid. We can uh, we can feed feed power into the pool. Get the pool price um, for whatever, which varies from moment to moment. But um, we have good forecasters working with us for the financials, um, and we can also um, sell the carbon credits um, on a separate market. And we have people lining up to buy those. And we also may look at, we're looking at PPAs as well, power purchase agreement, but right now it looks like we're just going to go with pool price and carbon credit sales. Um, but we're talking to some people who might be want to, might want to uh, buy the power uh, automatically as well. We'll look at that. So, yeah, that's kind of my presentation. I'm just going to say, um, certainly welcome anybody to uh, become a member. Um, only member can, only members can invest in our in our projects. Um, so we encourage you if you're interested in investing, the, the numbers are looking pretty good. Um, we've got some PowerPoints coming up for investors. Um, we've done a, um, a seed offering to a select group of uh, members who we knew were very close to the co-op and were anxious to see this as successful. So we did a seed raise about um, two months ago raised $189,000, which allowed us to then finish all the studies. So we're, um, so we're, people are already investing in the project. Uh, it's going to be a lot of money to raise, but we've also just found a group of uh, partners in the town of Peace River, right near where this is going to be built, the solar farm is going to be built. Um, and we just signed a partnership with them. And uh, they're like a sophisticated group of investors, I believe is what they're called. And they've got access to a fair bit of cash and they want to see this happen and they want to help us build some more of them. So we just signed that partnership and that's a huge leg up for raising the 11 million. Um, so that was huge. Anyway, membership, $200, but you know, um, it looks like it's next week we're having a member wide meeting where we're planning to reduce the membership from $200. There's a bunch of investment reasons uh, we've been advised to do this so we're going to try to do it let's see if our members will go for it um they probably will um so lifetime membership 100 bucks two people can join as one groups and organizations can join uh, businesses can join um the usual one one membership share uh, and you get you're buying a membership share in the co-op um and that also gives you the right then to purchase investment shares in our upcoming solar farm project, equal vote, all the usual things. Uh, plus, um, we have a, a blog that goes out to our members every two weeks on energy um, that I'm happy to say I write and I really enjoy writing it. It seems to be well written or I mean, well read. I don't know how well written it is, but I think it's pretty well done. And um and we're encouraging people to give these as gifts too. It's like being an investment cooperative, a large number of members 
allows us to raise a large amount of capital. So the bigger our membership, um, the more capital we can raise for bigger projects. And that This is based on a very successful European model. That's where we got the model originally, way back in 2003, when nobody was talking about energy co-ops in Canada. Europe has had a successful energy co-op history for, what, I don't know, 30 years anyway. And uh, it's membership based. They have some of them now have thousands and thousands of members and they own hundreds of millions of dollars worth of renewable energy infrastructure. So we said, whoa, that looks like a good idea. Let's see if that'll work in Canada. And that's what we've been trying to do. And of course, there are now many other renewable energy investment cooperatives across Canada. But that's the model. More members, bigger projects, more capital, more members, more projects, more capital raised from the members to benefit the members with returns on their investment dollars. So that's our model. That's what we're up to. So any questions on that? You got a comment in there that your newsletters are great from JP. Ah. <laughs> Hey, JP. I, I thought I saw your name on there. Good to see you. So glad you're here. Fantastic. Thanks for that. Hey, well, thank you so much, Don. I'm really, it's really inspiring to see all the different projects that your co-op has, has been able to take on in Dawson's Creek and Hudson Hope. Um, and there's so much that we can learn um, from your experience and um, as a trailblazer in, in renewable energy. Uh, so yeah, I know I have some questions percolating and if other people have questions, please put them in the chat um, and maybe we'll circle back and so that we have a question period at the end for everyone. Um, yeah, I feel very inspired by, by that presentation. Um, so now for our last speaker, uh, Love to hear from Goulet. Cynthia Samuel is here on Haida Gwaii. Uh, and then we'll open up afterwards for questions from folks. Thank you. Um, so what we have here is the kind of an introduction to the symposium um, that was held earlier this year. Um, on the co-op um, that we're forming. There's four board members on the um, the co-op, Natalie, Belleen, Marilyn, and myself. It's been, I think, a couple of years since it's been formed and just going through the slow process of um, all the paperwork that's required of a co-op. And we've had a couple of membership meetings um, over the last couple of years. So we're really also inspired by the um, the interest from the members um, to, to keep going. Um, so it is very new. And, um, you know, we're looking for large projects, clients to, to work with. Um, probably in the next year or two. Um, but just in reading or listening to the two presentations, you know, we're really inspired on what the potential of um, the Haida Gwaii co-op is. Um, so in terms of solar panels and other renewable energies that we can do. Um, so some, I guess some of the things that, um, that are on the are on the handout from March was um, they we held a, a symposium, All Island Symposium in 2018. So that's kind of um, um, what the inspiration was as well too. And we signed a declaration, the People's Clean Energy declaration for Adagwai at the All Island Renewable Energy Symposium. And the, the declaration aims to turn away from diesel generated energy and commits to the islands becoming energy sovereign. 
And after the symposium, people of Haida Gwaii remained enthusiastic and dedicated to island wild, wide independence. Community meetings and informal conversations have continued. And there has been a lot of shared excitement. The cooperative model is one way for us to be the owners, decision makers, and investors of the small scale renewable energy solutions. So in 2021, work picked up to, to form a renewable energy co-op from Haida Gwaii, and we have nearly finalized our governance structure with that. And so um, Marilyn's been really busy with all the all the legalities of having a co-op and um, working with like-minded experts and such as um, what we heard tonight. Um, okay, so um, <clears throat> so I do appreciate your patience. It's usually Marilyn that does these presentations, but um, it's baby baby time for everybody now. Um, so I guess the. Uh, <clears throat> Just um, on the co-op part, you know, it, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of um, dedication. And um, so just getting started on the Haida Gwaii co-op and just getting people out there and having other organizations doing the same thing in kind of a bigger scale. It, um, you know, there's room for everybody to do the same thing. You know, we can um all be responsible and um in having a re renewable energy projects so i'm excited about that too um yeah i i, I kind of think that's all i got for now and if anybody has any questions then i'd be happy to answer it What are some of the next steps for the um, for the co-op? Like what? Yeah. <clears throat> the next steps are, um, I think what we're going to do is kind of we'll look for some clients and come do some business plan writing and cash flow and put out um call out for members and um, I think that's in 2024 we'll be busy doing that and hopefully in the spring and summer we'll be able to do a formal launch of everything so you know some people know that we're around and you know we want to shout it out to the world that this is what we're doing and, and it's a good thing and we're excited to be able to to put that out there in the next while and um, potential partners. I mean, we need a lot of money. Guay Trust has a lot of money and, you know, those kind of things that we're, we're going to have to be working on in the next uh, 12 months. Great. Yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing how it all shapes up in the next few years. Um, yeah, how so much to all of our guests for speaking. We'll open it up now. If folks have questions, they can pop on um, and unmute or pop it into the chat. Um, I'll kind of start with one as people percolate on some of their um, some of their thoughts. And to all of our guests too, if you have comments for the other presenters or anything like that, please feel free to jump in also. Uh, but my first question is, for Dawn and having a, a successful co-op, uh, do you have any advice for, for new co-ops as they get started in renewable energy? Yes, I do. Um, I'd say based on our experience, um, how do I put this? Um, I would say what you need is a project. Um, 
like when we started when we started we had the wind farm project it was like laid laid out before us we like had to do it right otherwise we would lose the opportunity to uh be involved in the you know exploding wind industry in the peace region so we had to do it and it really got us off our butts and forced us to do something because we had a project we had a goal we had a vision we are suddenly had a purpose, um, a specific one. And now, and so then, then, then for the next little while, we didn't have a project. We were looking for projects. We were spending money. Our, our, our members' money was disappearing or the money that we had generated from the solar farm. We, we do continue to receive money from the solar farm for 25 years based on a sort of a royalty agreement that we came up with, uh, which is great. Um, but we didn't have a project. So membership kind of dwindled. Um, like we didn't get many new members. We didn't have much enthusiasm. The board wasn't very keen. We weren't moving ahead. We were trying to look at this project and that project and we were blowing money and we weren't, we weren't finding anything that was going to work. Um, and then the solar came way down. We got into the solar. So we had some income to maintain the cooperative um, and hire staff, et cetera, uh, train staff. And then, and then this about four years ago, we decided to do this solar farm. And then, since we've had that project, um, and we've been promoting it and talking about it, and um, and our membership has exploded, and the 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 enthusiasm is fantastic um, for, from our membership and from a bunch of volunteers, and the board of directors has really got fired up, and suddenly everything is just happening again. So we've been through both. We've been through the slow, not too sure what we're doing. Maybe we'll do this. Maybe we'll do that. Nothing much happening. Very low energy. Worried about the money, blah, blah. Until we got another project and then suddenly it took off. So I say if you're starting to want to start a, something that's going to be fun, interesting, and exciting, um, your co-op should start with a project. Something that will inspire people. Uh, that's probably bigger than you think you should be attempting um, that will really push your board and your members to get involved and make something really happen here that's really important and exciting if you've got that behind you i see nothing but success but if you're just kind of wandering around wondering what you're going to do and not too sure so i don't know it's going to be slow um but I don't know, you know, what kind of opportunities there are. You say there's a couple of solar farms going in. There's talk about wind. There's talk about tidal. You know, can the fledgling co-op on Haida Gwaii tap into one of these things and say, hey, you know, we can raise capital. We can help. We can be, we can be your local community support. Uh, that was a huge thing that we added to Bear Mountain Wind Park. We were the local people. All the members we got were local members right around the wind farm. We had huge buy-in. Well, you know, a bunch of corporations come in with big wind, big ideas about wind farms and solar farms, and they start talking to the local people and saying, oh, we're going to put it here, we're going to do that, and blah, 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 and they're not really involving local people. Well, they're going to get pushed back. It's happening all the time. They're going to get pushed back. It's possible anyway. They likely get pushed back. But if you've got a co-op on with, but if they have a co-op on side with them, They've got local buy-in, and then the local people start to buy shares in the co-op, and now they can start to benefit from the project locally. They're buying into it that way. So suddenly you've got community on side, maybe you've got corporate money behind it all, sure. <clears throat> but you're the local people doing the local stuff, and, and your members are going to benefit by buying into it um, in whatever way your co-op can figure out how to do, which is what we had to do as an investment cooperative. We had to figure out how to do that, and it, it works. <clears throat> anyway, that would be my advice. Get a project. Get something really exciting happening, and watch the members flood in, and the enthusiasm and the money comes in, too. So that's my advice. <laughs> oh, Dom, I like that. In for the stars, in big, exciting project. Um, oh, uh, and then for Maddie and, and Zoe, any... Like, how does the BC Co-op Association support emerging co-ops and, yeah, even support co-ops that have been around for a long time? 
Maddie, do you want to take that one or or I can't? I was going to say Zoe, do you team? want to take that one? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, we're responsive to requests for support and kind of the, there's the old saying that once you've seen one co-op, you've seen one co-op because no two are alike and no two co-ops have um, this. So, you know, if a group, um, you know, we probably receive three to five requests from folks around the province every month um, who are looking to start a new co-op. And so we'll have kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations with them. And then we'll kind of figure out whether the group is gelling and are there enough people and are they aligned in their vision for what they want to do? And do they have kind of back of the napkin um, projections around whether the co-op is going to be able to sustain themselves? And once we've kind of agreed that the co-op has promise, then it kind of unleashes a whole opportunity of supports that we don't we don't offer ourselves, but we convene a community of practice of co-op developers who all have really specialized supports. If it's to you know do a feasibility study or a business plan or set up a governance structure or work on incorporation documents, we're kind of that hub, as Maddie was talking about, that that kind of um, brokers connections and and helps to case by case, not so much these days, but um, to to find funding to support those engagements as well. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's amazing how many people are um, like the interest in co-ops has spiked in the last little while because when people are challenged to do it alone um, they realize there is a value in in collaborating and I think our job is really to assess whether it's just like it sounds like a great idea or whether this is actually like an enterprise or a nonprofit organization that can actually benefit its members and the greater community so we kind of meet everyone where they're at and and are that kind of reality check around is, is this actually going to work and if so let us help you um, by connecting you with people who can provide that support maddie do you have anything to add for that one uh no i thought that was great very very great response, Zoe. <laughs> Thanks, Zoe. I think that, yeah, connection piece is huge. And um, um, yeah, Eva, just hearing from Don today has been really inspiring to hear about other um, renewable energy co-ops and what's possible. So um, I'll offer that. Don, we have a question for you in the chat. Gualaga is asking, what was some of the pushback you guys dealt with when installing your wind farm or were there any with such community cooperative buy-in? I'm not seeing the question, where is it? Oh. Uh, just in the chat. Oh, here it is, okay. A pushback you guys felt, you guys dealt with when installing your wind farm. Yes, there was pushback. There's always pushback. <laughs> it's a lesson we've learned. Doesn't matter how wonderful the project is, somebody's not going to like it. Um, it was minimal, though, um, because we, as I say, we were on the ground and we were local people, and you know we're talking to these. But you know, uh, people got online and got all kinds of strange information about how wind farms were, wind turbines were extremely harmful and dangerous, and um, uh, so, yeah, there was some pushback. There was one farmer, um, it was sort of a farmer, um, lived right near the ridge. Uh, there was, you know, dozens of farms all around them. They, we had to talk to everybody, right? We had to go there and talk to everybody several times, um, just by because of the environmental assessment. You have to, and most. Most most of the people were like, "Cool, all right, all right, let's do it." Um, and uh, but there was one or two that dug in and said, um, um, "We don't want it. We don't like it. We don't want to see it. We think it's harmful. Uh, we don't see any point in it." Blah blah blah. That one farm that was nearest 
the uh, Alta Gas actually bought them out um, so that they like, bought their property because they wanted to sell it. And after after the fact, we actually found out. I think he he was he was such a jerk about it all because he actually wanted to sell his farm and he knew he'd have to buy them out. So I don't know. Um, so yeah, there was a little bit, but the main message here is that if you're a co-op and you're local and you're talking to the real people who you a lot of them you know, you know, um, the acceptance is very high. Um, but uh, even the solar farm, um, you know, we have one person who lives in sort of the area. Um, they might be able to see it, um, but they don't want it. They just don't want it um, anywhere near them or anything like this ever. So um, we have to talk to them. Uh, we have to answer all their questions as best as we can. Uh, it's part of the assess environmental assessment process. Uh, it's a hoop we have to jump through. Uh, we held a big open house, and this person came, and it was like 99% really positive. Um, we had councillors and regional district reps there, and they were all really keen on it, and you know, 50-odd local residents who were perfectly fine with it. Um, and the, But this one person came and, you know, just was dead set against everything we're doing. So I don't think that person can stop the project. Um, well, if we jump through all the proper hoops and answer all her questions as best as we can, um, but she's just being completely illogical and, and, and unreasonable. So I say, yeah, you're gonna get the odd one, probably. It's kind of like human nature, I guess. I don't know, um, but if you're local and you're a co-op and you're inviting them to be part of the project by joining the co-op and then they can invest in it if they want and make some money, um, but at least they'll be part of it. And it's a local thing, you know, cause it's a co-op. Uh, the feedback or the acceptance is very high. If that answers the question. Awesome. We got another answer. So Glaga says, Hella, thank you. Nice to hear about that support. And were there any issues with birds once the windmills were installed? We've heard that actually at our at our last meeting. Also, there were community concerns about impacts on birds if there was a wind um wind farm put here. Well, you know, wind farms can be done improperly just like anything else. Um, just because it's a wind farm doesn't mean doesn't make it one hundred percent good. <laughs> They have to be like everything has to be properly done, have to be properly placed. There was one just canceled in Alberta for good reason. They were going to build it right next to a huge wetland and a flyway of a whole bunch of migratory birds. And I, I'm glad it was canceled. It was in a bad place. Um, like it was not allowed. Um, our okay, our environmental assessment for our, our our wind farm, we had to do two years of pre-monitoring for birds um and then one and then well one year follow-up um but we uh, actually did two years follow-up to make sure uh, what we were finding in the first two years was true <clears throat> a very 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 minor bird issue uh, we did have a little more of a bat issue the ridge has got a whole bunch of cliffs uh, along the on, along the southwest side uh, like really steep rock cliffs and the wind farm is built along the top of those cliffs <clears throat> and we knew there were bat populations in there and we had to do some really serious bat monitoring um, and we have found some impact um, but it varies from a little bit from season to season um, and location to location along the ridge um, and there's some variables there but what we're what they're what they're trying to do now is to reduce that impact by um reducing the um rpm of the wind turbines in certain areas of the ridge during certain seasons and that seems to be helping 
um it's not like it's catastrophic um you're not finding piles of dead bats all over the place <laughs> but it's enough to be a concern but regular just bird birds no issues whatsoever no very 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 minor um your 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 uh, pet cat and i happen to have one here in the house probably kills more birds than our wind farm does um then that's that's close to factual i'm not exaggerating um but um but again like i said in the beginning you got to put your wind farm and your solar farm in an, an intelligent place um and not and not and not you know impact and keep the impacts as low as humanly possible but the impacts on uh, birds i've written several articles about this because it's a common misconception wind turbines are way down at the bottom cats and windows are way up at the top as far as bird kills go so you can look at the data it's online and it's true and um yeah so yeah we had to do a lot of studies on that and that was good we were happy to do those studies uh, it was very expensive and took years but we did it and it was excellent to do it because it can be a concern yes Oh, wow. Great. I'll open up if there's any last questions before we wrap up here or any final words from any of our speakers. Zoe. Yeah. I just had a question for, for Cynthia and maybe Valine just about um, hearing Dawn's um, good piece of advice to have a project. I'm just wondering if if the Haida Gwaii Renewable Energy Co-op is getting any closer to kind of securing it, its first project or its first client? Uh, no, there was um, there was one that um, Marilyn was meeting with, but um, we were just advised that um, their management is changing somewhat. So that's kind of like a, it's going to set back. Um, I don't know how long, probably six months or so. So hopefully, but there's some really good ideas that came out of tonight's session and um, I'm encouraged by, um, you know, the small communities that are um, having, have the wind farms and the solar panels and smaller, small communities such as um, Old Masset, like Hudson Hope, and um, the other smaller communities in the Northeast too. So, and the amount of memberships that they they can have. So um, it's encouraging to, to hear, you know, start small from a small community to big major projects, right? So that's encouraging, but um, just got to brainstorm and, you know, secure that first big project and, um demonstrate the success and hopefully it'll just flourish from there How about no, i'll just say a big project could be like a, the roof of a big municipal building like a event center or something you yeah. know that, that could be a significant project and it doesn't have to be a huge solar farm or a 200 million dollar wind farm <laughs> it could be just a big, nice big roof somewhere uh, and that would that would be a significant project to start with. And by the way, Cynthia, if there's anything we can do to assist, you know, do reach out to us. We have a lot of co-ops reaching out to us, looking for advice and a bit of help um, because we've had so much experience. So yeah. please feel free to do so, Cynthia, your group. It's very exciting to think that you're, I mean, you've got to be really rich with renewables. <laughs> I'm sure you are uh, yeah. on the islands. So by all means, uh, reach out to us if you if you need if you need us. Great, thank you so much. Well, on that note of wonderful collaborative support and connection, uh, I think we'll we'll close our our webinar tonight. Um, just want to say a big hawa to all of our all of our guests uh, that shared so much knowledge with us today. Um, I know my, um, oh, I don't know, JP, do you got a question before we, before we close? Oh, you're just waving to say goodbye. <laughs> nice to see you come on camera there. Um, 
yeah, just want to say a big hello to all of you. I know my, um, from my question at the beginning of like, how much do I know? I feel like it's a little bit higher now after today. Um, so yeah, take care, everyone. Thanks to everyone that's tuned in. And uh, I hope everyone has a good rest of your night. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.